Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here to help moderate this uh, talking circle. And thank you to Molly and Yamini for your beautiful stories of hope and um, inspiration. So I do have a couple of first uh, questions starting out. Um, the first question we got came in our chat, but we switched it over. Um, this is for Molly. Molly and your cute kitty. Your experience is very moving and inspirational. Thank you for your authenticity and deep sympathy for the sudden loss of your father, which clearly impacted you deeply. Can you share a bit more about your healing journey in terms of your substance use? Did you engage in any treatment around that? Or did you leave that work, it, uh, weave that work in more organically? Thank you for your question. Um, I would say that it was a bit of both. I think that after I went to the hospital and was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, um, I went to AA um, and I was doing some recovery here in Portland um, that it, it's called fourth dimension recovery and it specializes um, with teens and young adults that have experienced substance abuse. Um, so there was a time where I was trying to get completely sober um, and did that for a few months. And I think after that, I, I slowly incorporated having a drink casually, like if I went out to dinner, um, or went out with a friend, but I made sure that I monitored how many drinks I was having. Um, I think that for me, I went, I had such a like life altering thing happen to me when I had my manic episode and went to the hospital. I really had to start over from there because I didn't, I lost my job. Um, I, a lot of my friends stopped talking to me because they were very unsure what was going on. Um, and I lost a lot of other quote unquote friends um, that I was using a lot with. So when I got out of the hospital and I tried um, to get sober, I also didn't have as many people contacting me that I had previously used with. And so that really helped. Um, and I just felt like my life took a turn and um, I wasn't as interested in smoking weed. I knew that that had to stop. Um, and I wasn't really, I wasn't really around hard drugs anymore because of, I was more isolated after I got out of the hospital. And so it's just, I kind of had to like rebuild my life and my friend group and um, decided that it needed to be different than it was before. That answers the question. Thank you, Molly. This next one is for Yamini. What is one, this is from Pari. What is one thing that you would like to share with other immigrant and refugee youth that continue dealing with everyday biases and isolation? What is the best way for them to access the resiliency and build on it? And thank you. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, I think the biggest takeaway like that I kind of understood, especially like a, a little bit later in my therapy journey was that I think you have to recognize that A, not every therapist is going to work for you. I think the lack of representation um, of diverse backgrounds and ethnic, like just ethnic people in the field of mental health definitely affects how immigrant and refugee youth feel when they're seeking treatment because it's already hard enough. Like we have extra sets of bar barriers when dealing with mental illness and that like road to getting to therapy and medication and hospitalization. But then to sit there and talk to someone who may not necessarily understand or validate your experiences. Um, I remember like 
I had the same therapist from about eighth grade to my senior year of high school. And while in a lot of ways, she helped me come to terms with my mental health and my mental illness and validated my experiences, there were a lot of ways in which she didn't understand my cultural background and understand my family dynamics and the way in which my parents and I communicated with each other and the way in which I saw the world as an immigrant and as a girl of like girl of color in middle school in Portland, Oregon. Um, and so I guess for me, I think the biggest thing is to recognize that just because someone is telling you something that, oh, like, I think the one biggest thing was that my therapist would tell me that my parents were being verbally abusive. And, but it was because my parents, it would be for instances, like my parents just asking me to, why I didn't get a certain grade. And it was that, I didn't understand it at first, but it was her kind of playing into these like racialized stereotypes of, you know, she's coming from an Indian family. Her parents are Indian immigrants. They're probably, you know, pressuring her into getting a 4.0 GPA and going to Harvard, which if she had spent a little bit more time talking to me, I've never felt that pressure from my parents. That's never been my experience with academics or my experience with talking to my parents about what, what I wanted my career and future to be. But, you know, in her head, it was like Indian girl talking about grades with her family. This is like the recommendation that I'm going to make. And that doesn't it's not a one size fits all approach. I think trying like standing true and like what you know your values are and what you know your experience with the world is, even though you are now on this path to recovery is so important. Um, and I think also just especially for immigrant youth who are in these like oftentimes white spaces, um, understanding that even though your experiences are different than other people's, that doesn't mean that they're not valid. And educating your peers on, hey, like this is what I'm going through. Um, it might not look like this for you, but like this is what it looks like for me can be the biggest like bridge between cultural barriers. So I hope that answers the question a little bit, but. Thank you, yes. And then the next question kind of to piggyback on that, and you answered it a little bit, but do you have any suggestion in talking to different communities about the mental health stigma, especially when there um, culturally is more stigma around the mental health? Yeah, I mean, like I said, um, for me, like coming from a South Asian background, like especially living in India, but even then like moving to the US, um, so many of my friends, Indian or not, like Indian, Asian, like so many of my friends were dealing with mental health like issues with like forms of anxiety or depression or eating disorders or substance abuse. And like, it was never we talked about it amongst ourselves, but it was never something we felt like we could bring up with our parents just because it, we'd never heard those words in our households before. And so I think for me, once I started doing Asha and, you know, and my mom would invite her friends and like members of our family to um, like these events, we started learning more and more stories of like, you know, actually my cousin was dealing with suicidal thoughts and I had no idea. Um, our neighbor uh, was dealing with depression and we had no idea. And I think people sometimes, especially in communities of color, have this very like stereotyped negative view of what it means to come forward with saying that you have mental illness because you've already worked so hard to be, get to where you are, that you're so scared that saying, hey, I'm dealing with this problem can like make that all come crashing and tumbling down around you. Like I remember for my mom, one of her biggest concerns was would was if I talked to my school about having depression and having anxiety, would it go on my permanent record and would it affect my college admissions? So I think there's so much misinformation and so much fear that can contribute to this culture of silence um, within people of color. And I think it takes, you know, people of my generation to be like, hey, these are problems that we suffer from. This isn't just a quote unquote white person problem. Therapy is not just for rich people or for white people or 
X, Y, Z type of people, it's for everyone. And we all are dealing with something. We all have stuff in our lives that makes us feel some type of way. And I think it takes like people coming forward and feeling comfortable in spaces like this um, for people to feel comfortable sharing. And I think that's the only way we're ever going to overcome these challenges and overcome these barriers. Oh, I love that. Um, okay, next question is for both Molly and Yamini. Um, what would you share is the most helpful thing that a family member can do when you're struggling? Molly, do you want to take this first? Sure. Um, my mom is on here, so um, she she was she was the biggest advocate for me, um, and yeah, my family in general was just very helpful. I think that. Um, you know, making suggestions um, is always a good way to go about things, at least for me. I was never forced to go to therapy when I was struggling in high school. Um, it was a suggestion and it always came from like a place of love. Like it, it wasn't ever a, there's something wrong with you and we need to fix it and you need to go to therapy. It was always just a concerned, loving parent that wanted to see me get better. And so it was always a suggestion of therapy. Um, it was always a suggestion to, my mom would invite me on walks a lot. Um, I would deny her a lot too, but she never gave up on me in that way. Um, and she was the first one that ever suggested yoga to me. And I don't think she remembers that, but she did. Um, and, you know, I think that it really is just, sometimes I know that addiction and mental health can get to a certain point where people feel like they're enabling um, the person. And some people feel that um, they need to maybe distance themselves from a loved one because of that reason. And I completely understand that. Um, but I still feel like at least continuing to reach out and let the person know that you love them and you're always here to support them. Um, I think that was a big thing. No one ever gave up on me and um, maybe distance themselves from me, but never fully gave up on me and always had some sort of a helping hand um, or suggestion to offer. Thank you, Yamini, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I mean, I think like for me, like Molly said, like my parents just like never gave up on me. And like, I think it was also such a, while it was like a big process of like transformation and like just learning for me, it was also a huge journey of learning for them because this is something they'd also never, you know, like I'd never heard the word depression, anxiety or thought about therapy, but like neither had them, they, and like my parents grew up in India, like their entire lives. So to now come at the age of like, 40 something to an entirely different country and then be told by your daughter's school, Hey, your daughter needs therapy is scary because it's an entire, it's an entire system that you've never navigated and you don't know the implications. You don't know what's going to happen. And it's, that's also your child. So you're throwing them into this unknown and it was terrifying for everyone. Um, but I think the biggest thing that I appreciated my parents doing was being willing to say, I don't know, but let's find out, um, you know, my, so for your daughter to come home one day with like black eyeliner everywhere talking, like listening to this, like screaming music, um, is, and would make any parent be like, are you okay? Like what's going on? But my parents never judged me for that. You know, my dad would come home from work and like, take me to these concerts and like, yeah, he stood in the back with like earplugs in, but he was still there. He still showed up for me. Um, 
and was like, if this is what's making her feel better, then like, it's important that we invest time and energy in, in that. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think Molly put it perfectly, but yeah, they think it's just like showing up and however you can and making sure that they feel accepted and loved and that they, that, cause you're already feeling so much shame as someone who's going through mental illness. And like, you're already feeling like the biggest failure in the world and that you're letting so many people down that to be someone, especially your, like from your parents and your family, for them to be like, we still love you. We're going to be here for as long as it takes, I think, like does, means the world. Thank you. Next question is for Molly um, from Mackenzie. Thank you so much for sharing. Wondering, does weed have any adverse effects on bipolar? I was diagnosed with bipolar type one in 2007, but prior, almost any time I smoked weed, it didn't help me relax. The paranoia was unbearable. And often I was convinced I was dying. With that, I'm worried whether or not I can safely try CBD products for chronic muscle pain. Yeah, so that is one thing that I did not know. Um, my doctor told me later after I was diagnosed, I have bipolar one as well. Um, he put it as like, even people with other mental health disorders, he even mentioned like people that are schizophrenic um, have like an anxious, depressed, schizophrenic, um, they have different reactions to weed compared to somebody that is bipolar. And this is just related information. I'm, I'm obviously not a physician, but um, I did find out from my psychiatrist that um, there's just a different reaction that people with bipolar have, and it can trigger a manic episode. Um, and I think that that is why instead of it um, having that calming effect, and everybody, whenever I tell people I don't smoke weed anymore, they're like, oh, you haven't tried the right strain. I'm like, no, it just does not work for my brain chemistry. Um, and so it kind of does the opposite effect that a lot of people have um, with weed. And so I was told um, that's why I was getting panic attacks. Um, that when I was smoking weed, even when I was manic, that that was not it was kind of, um, furthering that episode. Um, and yeah, it's something that's not, that that's not super great for people that are diagnosed with bipolar. I'm not too sure about CBD though. I know that that is a little bit different. So I would definitely check with your doctor. Thank you. All right. We have a, a little bit, I'm going to ask you each one more question. Um, Yamini, one question for you is, did you ever find an art community to help you process the pain is the first part. And then I'm going to go on and tie another question in. Do you have plans to pub publish your COVID art book that you've been creating? Um, I think I've always been involved in like some type of art community, like my entire life, um, especially in high school. I know that... Um, Sorry about that. Especially in high school, I know that like my art program was so tight knit. It was like only about 25 of us. So we got very close. Um, and that was like a really amazing space for me to like grow as an artist and try new things and get feedback from my peers. Um, and in college, I kind of took a different route um, and started doing social media management for an org that I'm part of on campus. And that was like a very like like it was such a great creative outlet for me to be able to create content and like think of things in a different way, especially cause I'd never done like digital art before like that. So now it's a little bit more of just me like drawing and then, you know, like showing it to my friends from high school who are still part of like arts thing, art things. Um, and it, we do it via that, but um, I think there's always a community if you look for it. And I think, you don't necessarily like the other people don't necessarily have to be like art quote unquote artists, but I think everyone appreciates art in some way. So yes, I still have some kind of community. Um, and no, I've never really thought of publishing my COVID sketchbook. My mom has been trying to get me to create prints for ages now. Um, but it's never something that I've ever really considered seriously. 
just because I've been like, it's in my head, I'm like, who's going to, who's going to look at this? But um, yeah, it's a great idea. I'll definitely think about it a little bit more. Thank you. I think you have several fans on this Zoom that would, would be very interested in it. Okay, Molly, the last question for you is, is there a yoga workout that focuses on mindfulness, stress and anxiety, anxiety relief specifically that you host? You know, um, I, since COVID started and I lost my yoga job, um, I haven't been teaching since. And I love in-person classes. I prefer to do them. Um, if I got enough interest in online classes, then um, I would be happy to do some, you know, more restorative mindfulness type of yoga. Um, but it just, there's so much, there's so many online classes right now um, that I just didn't think I was going to even be able to, to compete. Um, but yeah, that being said, I mean, I, I always recommend that, I mean, if you don't take a class from me, um, to go online on YouTube. Um, and I think that any type of restorative yoga, um, is really great for relaxation and um, kind of body mind connection um, that I think is really helpful if you're not looking for like an intense workout or to get a sweat in um, and you're just looking for more of the uh, peaceful side of yoga. Um, yeah, I just got, I just wanna address um, so I stopped teaching yoga because my, the gym I was teaching at got shut down when COVID started. Um, and I went on a different career path. I'm working in real estate now and it's been very, very busy. Um, but I'm looking to get back into teaching yoga now that I'm, um, you know, six, seven months into my real estate career. So, um, yeah. Well, thank you both for uh, participating in the Talking Circle and for being brave and vulnerable and sharing. So uh, I just got a little text from Genevieve. Um, I think that we're ready to move on to the next, the next section. So thank you all. Mm -hmm.